the front. Um, okay, we'll start the session now. So, uh, all of you, I'm pleased to introduce Karuna, my friend Karuna here, who's come, who's uh, graciously accepted our invitation. And uh, Alicia, can you hear me? Yeah, okay. So he's graciously, you know, graciously accepted our invitation to come and talk to you about his field of work. So Karuna is experienced uh, evaluation specialist and an expert in qualitative, uh, quantitative rather causal impact assessment. He has a BTEC from IIT Madras and has master's degree in both economics and computer science. He currently consults with the World Bank and UN and provides guidance to governments, not just state government, central government and other countries' governments. Funders like Azim Premji, philanthropic uh, initiatives, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, NGOs like Public Health Foundation of India, PHFI, the Nudge Foundation, Ecom Foundation, and consulting uh, agencies like GIZ on project evaluations. He has also worked as a consultant with academic institutions like Institute for Finance Management and Research. He has worked in the field of uh, access to finance, rural livelihoods, climate resilience and public health, among others. He calls Goa as his home for foreseeable future. That's uh, where we had also met and he had explained what he does uh, as a livelihood. And it was quite interesting, you know, he stays in, lives in Goa and works from there and the, for the search and policy. And uh, he works from this little piece of heaven to keep his creative juices for flowing for the researches that he does. He's joining us from Goa today. His lecture will focus on application of qualitative and quantitative methods and pitfalls of unstructured research and the pitfalls of making assumptions in research. Uh, we'll take questions after his uh, presentation. Hope you ha have a very insightful and interactive session with him today. Uh, over to you, Karuna. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'll just start my, open my screen. Just let me know if you can see my presentation. Yeah, can you see my no, presentation? No, no, not yet. Just a second. Not yet. I'll just, maybe I'll have to unpin. Yeah, I think uh, it should be there now. Yes. Yes, we can see the presentation. Great. So this is just a gentle uh, introduction. Uh, let me know if my voice is not clear or sometimes I tend to talk a little fast. Uh, feel free to, uh, to alert me when I do. And uh, so I'll talk for an hour and uh, then uh, uh, we can have a, a Q&A session. So uh, I'll get right down to it. Um, this uh, presentation is organized like this. First, I'll tell you my background and how it can uh, relate to uh, the kind of research that you all might be doing. Uh, some uh, couple of uh, illustrative examples of how like uh, wrong research or poor research can, let to, uh, can lead to wrong conclusions. Um, I'll give you a, a, a introduction to what is quantitative, what is qualitative research. And uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of studies that I have done. Um, I'll give you a background of research, uh, the, the landscape in India and um, career options for you to consider. And then we can open up for questions. Um, right. So, so basically, I've been trained uh, and brainwashed, uh, frankly, uh, by the Department of Economics. So all of the research that I do are for in applied economics research. Uh, the use of economics in statistics is called econometrics. That's what I use. And um, I do socioeconomic research, uh, which focuses on people, economic lives, and how it interplays with their family and community. Um, socioeconomic research studies economic and other outcomes, such as incomes, labor, working, consumption, uh, poverty levels, health outcomes, climate change outcomes, 
uh, things like that. An example is, you know, the Swachh Bharat mission. Uh, an example of something that I would study is to what extent did people start using toilets uh, as a result of the scheme. Uh, these, these are broad methods that are applicable in your field as well. So one of the most famous and earlier examples of, uh, say, a mistake um, uh, with poor sampling design um, goes all the way back to the US, which is always, always a, fore, uh, a forerunner in, uh, in uh, collecting data and, and, and analyzing it. In 1948, this is a picture of uh, the President Truman uh, who actually ended up winning the elections, but one of the newspapers uh, based on, um, on a wrong uh, exit poll uh, actually published that uh, his opponent beat him. And uh, this is him chuckling away saying that, hey, um, I heard some of the news, right? And um, what is the reason for this? The polling company found and found their mistakes, right? which is what they did was quota sampling, which is that let's say in the US 90% is white and 10% is black, right? And if they, they uh, and then uh, they might have just interviewed uh, 100 white people and 100 black people. And if a lot of uh, black people voted for Dewey, then the exit poll may suggest that Dewey was gonna win, but this is not a correct way of doing it. They should have ideally interviewed 90 white people and 10 black people. Right, and then taken the average to see how many people voted for which president. And they found this mistake, and then they moved to a random sampling, which is representative of the population, which, like I said, would involve interviewing. I'm, of course, simplifying it just to communicate the point. Um, they would have interviewed 90 white people and 10 black people. That would have given them a, a better picture. And so they moved to a random sampling. Another example that I studied uh, a lot is that in 2005, right, Mohammed Yunus, as some of you may know, won the Nobel Prize for microfinance, uh, which basically means giving small loans to women who are not working to help them earn some money by running a small business, maybe buying a cow or running a small Kirana store uh, to make some extra income for themselves and for their families. But uh, it wasn't well researched and intuitively it sounded like a great idea. For like a decade almost, funders across the world thought this was the silver bullet for reducing poverty uh, based on just uh, subjective judgments, talking to people, maybe getting convinced by these uh, lenders uh, to the poor, but not based on rigorous studies and billions of dollars went into supporting uh, what are uh, called microfinance institutions, which is small loans to poor women, right? And uh, then a bunch of academics, uh, and the first of them was the Indian um, uh, Abhijit Banerjee, uh, who won the Nobel for Economics, I think a couple of years ago. He was the first guy to study uh, uh, rigorously micro, uh, micro lending. And then 10 others studied it, and they found little or no impact on poverty. And this completely overturned the conventional wisdom on the topic. So this is another example where you don't do proper research, for something complicated where you're giving, say, money and some support to poor people for them to uh, use it to change their behavior to generate more income that you don't have direct control over, right? So just taking a call based on what you see, uh, you know, uh, when it involves complicated uh, behavior change, uh, uh, you could uh, 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 run into uh, form erroneous conclusions, okay? Now, what kind of broad uh, types of research are there? General research, you just want to know more about something, anything, okay? And I'll give you examples of it uh, in the next slide. Uh, the next type is formative research, which you do typically in the beginning of a project, okay? Uh, in order to inform how best to design it or how best to implement it, okay? Then there is evaluation. Uh, you want to know whether a project met its stated objectives, whether it was implemented well, designed well, does it did benefit uh, the stakeholders the way it was supposed to do? This is typically done at the end of the projects. It's called uh, an exposed evaluation to gauge its effectiveness or in the middle of it to improve it before you know, the project period stops. Finally, and most interestingly is what is called impact evaluations or impact assessments. This is a very specific type of an evaluation where very specifically you want to know to what extent an event A caused B, right? An example can be um, uh, maybe there's a scheme to promote, uh, uh, what's, what's a good example? 
uh, okay, did the uh, odd even license plate scheme in Delhi, right? To what extent did that scheme uh, uh, contribute to decreasing pollution in Delhi? That's very specific. We don't want to just see the change in pollution, but we want because of this odd even uh, uh, license number uh, uh, restriction, uh, uh, because of that, what is the change in pollution, okay? This is not the same, causality is not the same as correlation. Uh, just because A happened before B or um, in a graph, it looks like A and B are, you know, related, doesn't mean that A caused B, you know. The pollution might have changed at the end of the scheme, but that doesn't mean that because of the scheme, um, uh, the pollution maybe changed because of change in weather conditions, uh, change in crop burning, you know. So this is an important thing for you to learn. We don't usually learn much from a correlation study which is that just because a variable A is, you know, changing the same as uh, similar to a variable, an outcome B, we'll never know, uh, maybe some a third factor cost A and B, right? An example is education, right? Um, economists often think that education is useless, although many have studied and find that education increases, uh, uh, explains some of the increase in income of graduates, okay? But we, uh, if we do a naive study, correlation study, uh, let's say comparing somebody's income before of say somebody's uh, a graduate's income just against a non-graduate's income, uh, we won't know the uh, to what extent their education costed, maybe because graduates are just smarter or more well-connected uh, than non-graduates, right? So we won't know the exact contribution of schooling to this uh, uh, difference in, uh, in wages. Now, I've taken a few examples from your class projects just to give you an example of one of each of these. Um, so, um, yeah. So, one of the examples was how do you improve uh, the existing lighting system on a, of an outdoor basketball court for players, right? This is formative because you're thinking of designing a basketball court. And um, uh, because of that, uh, uh, it's you, you want to... Uh, some, some evidence to inform, to guide your design. So this is something that I would call formative. The first one, which I'll use as an example in bold uh, for uh, in the latest slides is, uh, does watching true crime shows have any psychological effects on the, on, the, on the viewers, right? This is impact. We are saying because of watching true crime, exactly because of that, what is the change in some psychological variable or characteristic in the viewer? Uh, do the present government policies for slum housing account for a home or is it just a shelter? This is clearly evaluation. And uh, relationship between identification <laughs> under uh, late stage capitalism and the built environment, that is a general one which doesn't fall under any category, but just something that the researcher wants to know. So I'll talk about quantitative qualitative and mixed methods, okay? Now, uh, quantitative usually refers uh, to, one second, uh, refers to a survey-based data collected on a population, on the entire population, it's called a census, right? The census of India is a survey on all citizens of India, or uh, it could be a sample, right? I don't know what sample survey examples you know, but there's something called the National Sample Survey Organization, which does this. For instance, to find out how much uh, people are earning every year, which the current government is, you know, stopped for a couple of years and it's resuming. <laughs> no, that's that's no. <laughs> Hello, is everything okay? Yeah, yeah. I think someone just yeah. switched on their mic by mistake. Yeah. Okay, oh. fine. Um, so, uh, was it a reaction to the government thing? Um, okay. So, um, so what is it used for? You can use it for formative general research as well as for evaluations, right? So what you do, uh, quantitative research, you know, you collect survey data um, from people or facilities like say a hospital or a school um, or a college or an architectural college uh, that can be easily asked and answered, right? Even if you want, if somebody wants to know the question, okay, to what extent does joining architectural college uh, improve uh, uh, the, the students, graduating students wages, right? Uh, um, so, but this is for questions that can be easily asked and answered, not for complicated questions such as how do you feel about your experience in college, right? If you simply want to know, okay, what is the average salary of, of graduating students, right? 
you would just ask a simple survey. Maybe you want to divide it by gender, uh, urban, rural, um, by your grades, in order to calculate wages for different kinds of graduating students, right? So typically you do a survey for calculating averages of some unknown population value, right? Uh, such as what percentage of households in a district is vaccinated, what is the average rate of children in district, or what is the average uh, placement salary of students in a college, right? So how do you do this? You carefully craft a very simple questionnaire where all the answers are either multiple choice tick answers and uh, or their numbers, okay? And uh, a low tech, uh, less educated surveyor can easily read all these questions when he's interviewing someone and write down the answers. The person analyzing the results is different from the enumerator or the surveyor, okay? And um, uh, the sample size can vary a lot, okay? From 200 to 10,000 or even more. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So let's take an example again, right? What percentage of homeowners in Bangalore would like to have solar power, right? So clearly you can't go and interview all the households in Bangalore. So what you would do is you would interview a, a sample of the households to estimate the, what is unknown, right? The average of um, uh, the average percentage of all homeowners, nobody knows it. The idea is as close to the truth, okay? Uh, by choosing a, a, a good sample, okay? Within a margin of error, okay? And I'll explain what is margin of error in just a second. Now, this sample should be representative of the population so that the sample average, you expect it to be an unbiased estimate of the unknown population average for this question, right? And so you would do this by not only say interviewing richer people because they might have like to have solar power more, but it should include poor as well as uh, richer people. Otherwise, you will get a wrong value. And the way to do a representative sampling, one way to do it is maybe you get the voters list, which may be pretty close to everyone living there. And you randomly select uh, some of those people and then you go and interview them. This way you are sure that it is uh, a truly a representative uh, selection. If you only select uh, interview people that are easier to, to find an interview, let's say through a phone survey or where only people with a phone and uh, you know, uh, who, are, uh, who have the time to speak to you will answer, you may have an unknown extent of bias to answer this particular question. Now, sample size, I, this is an important point, right? The, there will always be a margin of error in any sample size because you can't interview everyone, right? So the margin of error refers, let's say again, the same example of what percentage of uh, Bangalore would like to have uh, solar power, right? Um, uh, it refers to the maximum deviations from the population average that the sample average is likely to have. So the bigger your sample size, okay, the smaller your margin of error, you'll be closer to the truth. Well, if you, if you interview 10,000 people, you'll be very close to the truth. But if you interview, interview only 50 or 100 people, you may have a high margin of error, say plus or minus 30%, right? which is very high. While if you interview 10,000 people, you may be plus or minus 1% of the truth. Now, a key thing that very few people actually know this is that a sample size is not a judgment. There's a formula, a statistical formula. There are plenty of online calculators and resources for you to do it. You put your, uh, among other information, the margin of error, and it tells you what the sample size is, okay? For a tolerable margin of error and uh, around the true but unknown population uh, average. So um, one interesting thing is that, uh, okay, how do you choose your sample size, right? You choose your sample size because interviewing more people takes more time and money, uh, but you'll be closer to the true. Uh, while if you interview less people, you can get it done quickly, but you won't know how much off you are. So, so you should choose your sample size and hence your margin of error such that your decision will not change depending on what the value uh, uh, you find in your sample average, right? For instance, COVID, uh, you interview 10,000 uh, for COVID for government, right? Um, uh, it, you choose a sample size such that uh, if it's too small, if the margin of error say between five to 40, right? Then that is not helpful. So that's too small, but um, you should choose maybe like a, a larger sample size so that the margin of error between one to 2%, okay? Uh, which case, uh, whatever decision the government chooses, right? Whether to continue the lockdown or take away the lockdown, right? 
their decision won't change whether it's one or two percent, right? They say, okay, let's uh, 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 roll back lockdown. Well, if they're not sure whether it's between five percent and forty percent, then they won't know whether it is time to uh, uh, roll back lockdown or not. Okay. Um, sample size. Another interesting thing that hardly anyone understands, even people feel, is that the sample size doesn't depend on the size of the population. Whether you want to calculate something for Bangalore or all of India for that matter, right? This it will be roughly the same sample size. Okay. Now, um, next uh, interesting thing is what is called an impact assessment. Like I said, to what extent exactly an event A caused B? So again, taking the example from one of our class projects, what is the extent of psychological effects on a person from watching true crime uh, shows, right? So how would you go about doing this? The key is that you want to find a comparison group, which is identical to the group uh, being studied, which is a treatment group, which is uh, watching true crime shows, okay? Which is identical to this group in all ways, except that uh, they are not watching true crime, which means there should be the same age, same education, same gender, same everything, right? Uh, same psychological condition before they start watching and all that. So that is the key thing. Now, the way you would do it is that you find a good comparison group, then you would uh, interview, uh, let them watch true crime shows maybe for like six months, and then you give them a survey with psychological tests, and you, for whatever psychological variable you choose, you calculate the average for the treatment group, the group that's watching the crime shows, and then the group that's similar but didn't watch the true crime shows, take the average, take a simple uh, 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 difference in the averages, and that is the impact of watching the show. Of course, it's not as simple as I say it. Uh, uh, you use. Uh, Hello? Yeah, uh, you use econometric methods to analyze the data and it's, it's kind of complicated. You need to uh, master statistics and economics for this. Now, how would you go about finding a control group similar to a treatment group? This is actually kind of fun and interesting. There are many ways to do it. And uh, I would say that a, a big part of applied economics, all the economics research in the world, right? A big part of it is really to do this, is to find a, a valid control group because before and after comparisons for a variety of reasons don't work, right? If you want to say, see if uh, farmers using uh, doing natural farming, whether they get uh, make more money than uh, uh, farmers uh, organic farming compared to those who do pesticides based farming, right? You can't just compare their incomes because maybe uh, in some areas the weather, you can't do a before and after comparison. Maybe the monsoons were terrible uh, uh, after, you know, a harvest season uh, compared to before. And so uh, you would be measuring the impact of weather and not your organic farming. Okay. Um, so the, most, the gold standard is called a randomized controlled trial. You may have heard of AB testing in the private sector. Um, pharma drug trials uses uh, ideally, ideally, sometimes they, uh, many times they don't. So in our example, right, for crime shows, you would take, recruit 500 people, okay, and randomly select the researcher, randomly selects 250 and puts them into a treatment group and tells them, watch the crime show. Since these 250 were selected randomly by the researcher, uh, we can expect that they were identical in all ways, except for watching the true crime show. And you can, in fact, verify it by doing a baseline survey and capturing, asking a bunch of questions to satisfy yourself that they are, in fact, identical. Okay? Or you could, uh, uh, then you ask them to watch the true crime show. They may not do it. So maybe you encourage them by paying them some money to watch it. Or something that Netflix and the OTTs do is that they, may, uh, you, they can randomly advertise more of true crime shows to the 250 randomly chosen uh, watchers. They actually do things like this. That's how uh, they figure out some of the things uh, uh, what to display to you, right? Then you give both tests, uh, both groups the same test and take the difference. And then you conclude that whatever difference in, in psychological variables between the groups is only because of uh, watching crime shows and not because of, uh, say, the war in Ukraine. Okay. So, um, what are other clever ways of finding a comparison group? Okay, I'll give you a few examples uh, that uh, that are kind of uh, interesting. Um, the 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 central government passed a law once saying that for uh, uh, gender equality, that a certain percentage of gram panchayat president posts had to be reserved for women. Okay, and they selected these places randomly. 
So researchers compared these gram panchayats uh, to ones which are, uh, you know, uh, typically will be male uh, 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 run by a male to find out whether having a woman president, in fact, led to improvement in quality of services that women voters care about. Okay. Uh, another example of where in health, in the health field, right? If, they, if uh, science, uh, researchers want to compare two people, uh, but uh, for whatever reason, they want them to have similar genetic makeup, right? Um, uh, to find out, uh, yeah, to find out the influence of upbringing on, on your psychology or whatever, right? You can compare twins because they'll, uh, they're likely to have similar genes. Another uh, study is uh, during the Beijing Olympics, right? Uh, the government asked them to shut down pollution by factories, right? So some scientists compared the health of newborn babies just before this and just after uh, 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 just after uh, there was a, a suspension of pollution to compare the effect of the health on newborn babies. Okay. Uh, another thing that you could do is um, if a government scheme right is to give say uh, some some uh, cash transfers to poor households, let's say because they are affected by COVID, and they say okay we we can't uh, fund everyone. We're only going to fund poor people uh, who are making 50,000 rupees, uh, less than 50,000 rupees a year, right? So the treatment group here could be those who are earning between 50,000 and 51,000. And your control group could be who are ineligible for this, uh, could be those who are earning between 49 to 50,000. And then you give them a survey a year later and to see what are the benefits to them, uh, to the group that got the cash transfer. Uh, because uh, uh, of the uh, uh, on their say income or uh, you know uh, other economic outcomes, and of course encouragement design is you just pay people and you know paying people always works right. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, about qualitative research. Um, what is it? Uh, what is it used for? Right. So um, qualitative research. Uh, um, basically is used is best for formative research right for instance there's a new app and uh, the app uh, designer uh, wants to uh, test out the app's ui on different groups right uh, by uh, uh, one sec. Um, maybe he wants to know how uh, people, different groups in terms of age gender urban rural uh, backgrounds right how how they can uh, how uh, user friendly the, the app is right this is something uh, that you would use a qualitative research for. You use it for, say, exploring a phenomenon that you don't know much about in terms of, okay, what do people feel about gender, gender sensitive urban planning, for instance, right? Or for something, understanding something complex, what do rural parents feel about girl child education? Okay, it's a very complicated thing. Uh, to informing, uh, uh, designing the questions in a structured quantitative survey by finding out uh, what people think or feel about the service that they received, right? Um, um, and um, a qualitative research is not designed to be a representative of the whole population, but to just understand what a, a group uh, uh, feels or thinks about something in a deep way, okay? So how do you do this? Um, typically, it is a mix of one-to-one uh, -one interviews and focus group discussions. You don't use a structured questionnaire. Instead, you use a questions bank to guide the interview with uh, follow-up questions. Uh, it's open-ended. You just have a freewheeling chat. It just depends on your curiosity, your uh, ability to communicate with people, to, to dig deep into something that's very complicated. Okay, um, And uh, this is typically done by an expert, uh, experienced and qualified researcher, not by a low-tech person. Okay, And uh, how do you do this? The sample size can be between two to 200 or even uh, two to 100 or even 200. You stop when the answers start getting repetitive. Okay, So you will develop your own intuition for what is a suitable uh, number of people you should interview. The limitations of this is that the first thing is that uh, it reflects the judgment of the researcher. Okay, Because uh, I just go and talk to like 50 people and come back and write a report and try to convince you about something. right? Uh, what do parents think about girl um, girl education, girl child education, right? So um, whatever I learn, I have to convince you. So it needs a lot of experience, sound judgment, and you have to be diligent, right? Because you can't verify what I've done because there's no real data, right? Um, and so it is tougher to convince the audience, audience about the correctness 
and people don't take small sample if I, if you if i just told you i interviewed 50 people you wouldn't take uh, what i say that seriously uh, as opposed to if i say hey i interviewed 10000 people right so the researcher has to decide from whatever she hears what is generalizable across the group that is uh, of interest or what is something idiosyncratic or unique to just the one respondent okay and convince the reader that these are generalizable conclusions about that group okay now mixed methods uh, is just using both qualitative as well as quantitative like i said you need to do a good qualitative study to explore uh, in order to ask the right questions in a simple structured interview so there's a little bit of hype about this i think both of these are just required part of uh, uh, of, of any study Uh, I'll just take a pause here. Shall I just continue or uh, should we take a pause for any reason? Um, do you want to take questions about whatever you've talked about till now or we'll do it later at the end? Uh, it's up to you. Uh, I, mean, I was just uh, kind of just taking a pause just to see, just uh -huh. to do a temperature check. So I can, I, I'm happy to continue or, or field questions. What do you want, guys? We pause for a second for a minute for you to analyze whatever, we, whatever you've learned or continue. We'll continue. Yeah, yeah, continue, Karuna. That's all. Yeah, if so you're okay, is, what I've been saying, has it been clear uh, or, uh, you know, uh, at least a few points, uh, uh, has it been clear so far, you think, or? Yeah, most of them are saying yes. A few of them are have blank faces here, so I don't know. Okay, uh, fine. Anyone with any anything to add or to ask at this point? Karun, I think you continue and then we'll have a discussion later. Okay, no worries. Yeah. So uh, this slide is just for the sake of completeness, really. Uh, economics and the kind of research that most people will do is to find out, you know, the crucial thing is to, you know, whatever we discussed right now, just to, just for the sake of completeness, completeness what is uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence about, right? Um, these two things focus on prediction and forecasting, okay? Um, uh, right? Uh, um, I think, I think you have exam, you know, examples of what a forecasting problem uh, may be. Um, uh, a simple example is, uh, you know, uh, even like uh, uh, predicting weather or predicting uh, changes to say pest attacks and, you know, insects that you see because of, of change in weather, right? Will it happen or not, right? That is the prediction problem, right? You also use it for doing things that, uh, for machines to do that human beings can do easily, such as identifying a cat in a picture or for machines to do things that are tough for us, such as chess. So I don't want to talk further about it, but I just want to communicate the point that this is about forecasting, which typically the methods of statistics are not good at. Okay, um, that's, the, that's the only point I want to communicate here. So I'll give an example of a couple of uh, my studies. Okay, you would have heard about the National Health Protection Scheme that uh, the current uh, government launched. Okay? Um, uh, with a considerable budget, uh, not, a, uh, not a crazy budget, but like a, a sizable budget, right? Basically, uh, India has one of the highest out-of-pocket health expenditure in the world. And uh, this is a scheme to provide free or subsidized hospitalization insurance for the poor, where they can go to some hospitals and it's free if you have the card, right? So I studied an earlier version of the scheme. Uh, the scheme was launched in some states first, but not in others, okay? Uh, so the other states where it was launched later became a comparison group, okay? And so I compared the two states, uh, but with a lot of statistical methods. I compared the out-of-pocket health spending between the two sets of states using a large government household survey data that was done uh, in a representative manner in all the states uh, before and after the scheme uh, in India, in all the states. And I found no impact. Uh, like many other studies also found that the scheme simply did not alter, uh, uh, decrease the out-of-pocket health uh, spending of poor people. Okay? But government still continued the scheme without really telling us to what extent the new scheme addressed the shortcomings of the previous scheme's uh, design. Okay? Uh, another example, again, focusing on health, is that uh, in India, right, uh, there's free hospitalization insurance uh, schemes, right? But not for outpatient. So hospitalization means you spend at least one night in bed, while outpatient means you leave the, uh, the say you don't spend any time on a bed. 
Um, but uh, four people get sick and go to hospital for things like diarrhea or typhoid, uh, which if treated in time, uh, if they went to a primary care physician in time, they would not, it would not become so bad that they would need to get hospitalized, right? So an NGO called uh, Care <coughs> Foundation and the International Labor Organization uh, funded uh, my organization and I designed a study to offer uh, outpatient uh, healthcare uh, using a card uh, to uh, rural poor in Maharashtra. Okay? So we knew that people aren't going to pay for this card. So we selected a few villages and in each village uh, I identified some uh, households and gave them the card for free. Okay? So this group became, they used the card a lot and hence the, they went to the doctor a lot. And so they were the treatment group. The rest didn't buy much, hardly any, any at all since they were poor. And so I did a survey, a detailed household survey of both these groups in about 50 villages. Okay, there were 10 uh, people that got the card for free in a village and 10 who didn't. And so that's a treatment control group, 20 in a village, over 50 villages, so around a thousand people. I did a survey a year later and asked them, okay, how much do you spend on health expenditure? And how many days of, uh, you know, were you hospitalized, right? And then I took a difference in the average between the two groups, and I did find that it reduced the number of days spent on, uh, on a hospital bed. Okay? So we can uh, conclude that having this card will, uh, uh, as they say, what a stitch in time saves uh, nine, uh, uh, reduces uh, uh, hospital a day spent in a hospital. So um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, research uh, in India. And uh, this is an area where uh, uh, we, we are struggling way behind OECD countries. Uh, there is little use of evidence uh, of effectiveness of a scheme in policy making in India. I mean, for example, somebody uh, in uh, Niti Aayog told me that uh, sometimes a minister uh, would just come to a bureaucrat and tell him, okay, design the scheme word, I don't know, 5,000 crores, right? And they'll give them two or three days to design a scheme, right? And obviously, like, you know, it's not going to turn out well uh, if you're uh, just going to blindly rush into a big scheme without uh, spending enough time to design it, right? Um, uh, there is no culture of evidence-based thinking in government as well as NGOs in India. Uh, it's just what it is uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, we can talk about it uh, later. Uh, I'm not sure about the private sector. I have worked in the private sector um, such as an IT, uh, I, I worked in technology before I joined this field. Um, it's tough to say uh, uh, to what extent it's used. Uh, I'm sure they'll use user surveys, um, but I think it is tough to answer, produce evidence for complicated questions that uh, businesses can use immediately, right? So they need to use a lot more of judgment because the nature of the questions, I think are like too complicated and not amenable for iteration, right? Such as a research-based uh, approach uh, make you do. Except in A-B testing, Google, Facebook, all of these online um, uh, social media, all, all of these online apps uh, routinely use A-B testing. For instance, if they want, um, what's a good example? Maybe the positioning of uh, some picture somewhere on, the, on your screen, right? Uh, uh, we're all guinea pigs. Uh, they'll randomly select some of the users and introduce a slightly different user interface to see you know, uh, which one of them generates more ad sales, right? That's called A-B testing. So to that extent, it's there, but I'm not sure. I haven't seen too much evidence of it uh, in, in other uh, kinds of uh, private sector areas. Um, so I think that uh, given that uh, you know, research is limited, um, uh, one should spend uh, more effort in formative research rather than in evaluations after the project is completed simply because it is better to design a project well rather than to find uh, problems and mistakes uh, through an evaluation after a project is completed, right? Um, unfortunately, there is a shortage of good researchers and research consulting agencies in India who can do a good job. Um, many studies are, that you might read are, are in fact erroneous. Um, I'm sure those of you that read Times of India, well, stop reading Times of India, but if you do, um, um, particularly about health, right? Health, diet, nutrition, those kinds of things. I think you, if you read it regularly, you'll find that you'll find articles that are saying the opposite of each other every so often, okay? And 
all these articles will quote some Harvard, some some study somewhere. Okay, it's just because uh, you know they, they they haven't done a good job of of the research. Uh, that's just the nature of how it is. Particularly, I would say in the health and nutrition space, simply because in in those fields they they want to say something. They do correlation studies and causal impact evaluations because it is tough to do. For uh, yeah, it's just tough to do, right? Uh, especially with uh, health related uh, uh, projects. Um, and so uh, they do correlation studies, so you don't uh, end up learning much about it, or the sample size may be too small, or it may be a biased sample. Uh, because those kind of fields, they want to tell you something about something important, even without rigorous evidence. Okay? While actually on the other end of the spectrum in economics, the field of economics, what you'll find is that uh, the studies are way more believable, but the kind of topics that they usually choose are ones that are not very interesting. Um, uh, uh, for the public, but uh, more just because they were able to arrive at a good research design for those kind of studies, you know. So, um, uh, so yeah, so uh, in part because there's shortage of good researchers and good evidence in India, uh, it's also a reason why uh, I think that uh, uh, convincing policymakers, politicians, as well as bureaucrats, uh, pro uh, there's no one, there's enough people there to generate enough good evidence to uh, help them uh, design uh, uh, and implement uh, better projects. That's partly, I think, also a reason for the poor uh, evidence-based approach in India. And uh, even survey companies, you may know famous companies like AC Nielsen, um, uh, who uh, make a living simply out of doing surveys, right? Normally, they may do it for market research, for like Coke and Pepsi and whatnot. But uh, I've hired many agencies, paid them 2,000 rupees per interview for, like, say, 4,000 people, but still uh, some of the data ends up being cooked up. So there is uh, an issue with uh, uh, the quality of evidence that's uh, there in India. So uh, your um, career options, right? <clears throat> so because of these reasons, uh, see, it's, uh, it's super fun. It's intellectually interesting. There is a shortage of uh, HR. And there is a need if not, there's not a demand in India. So it's cool if uh, you want to join research. Um, you can consider uh, behavioral economics. Uh, it's a fun intersection of uh, psychology and uh, economics. Uh, it's super fun, actually. Uh, it's super fun. Um, uh, so uh, the, I think that area would even be more applicable or more helpful uh, for architecture uh, uh, graduates. Um, but what I would say is that good research is tough. Uh, it needs a lot of experience in mastering the statistical uh, techniques. Um, uh, this is an example where a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. Um, when I first learned, when I graduated, I thought, uh, you know, yeah, I know everything. And, you know, I, I made a lot of mistakes. Um, which I only learned uh, uh, to correct over a period of time. So um, either do it properly, it's tough, either master it well or let somebody else do it. Um, uh, that's my suggestion. And for a career, uh, this is more my own personal experience in my field, which is uh, development economics, right? I work in the area of uh, projects and evaluating projects uh, for the poor mainly. Uh, a PhD is better. There is often a uh, master's enough uh, in terms of uh, technical methods that you will have to learn. Uh, and then you can uh, improve it uh, by learning on the job. But there is no, there are fewer of those opportunities and it's not a structured one. There is no structured career path. While for PhD, the PG track has a more structured career path. If you want to do it just based on a master's because you, know, you think you've learned enough, then you need to take a lot more initiative and shape your own career. Uh, it just doesn't come out of the box in terms of um, organizations hiring people for research with just a master's. Okay? So that's something to uh, to keep in mind. Um, I just want to sum up uh, um, the key points that I wanted to communicate today. I think uh, the, the president of PHFI, one of the organizations, Public Health Foundation of India that um, uh, uh, that Anupriya was talking about, uh, his, uh, he is a brilliant guy. Uh, absolutely brilliant guy. Srinath Reddy, you would have seen his articles in Hindu and everything. And for presentations, he would often say, first tell people what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then uh, at the end of it, tell them what you just told them. So, um, and also my prof uh, uh, in economics, right? Uh, he did tell me that uh, 
his students, he was a brilliant teacher of economics. Uh, he did tell me that uh, students are going to forget 80% of what they learned in school. Uh, so the key uh, role of an instructor is just to give some main messages that, uh, you know, that stays with them forever, right? So the first point is that correlation is not the same as causality. Um, just because people uh, with an architecture degree earn more than others doesn't mean that it's only because of their degree. Maybe they are so smart that whatever they have studied, they would, they would still uh, you know, manage to make a good career, right? So correlation is not the same as causality. And we can't learn much from correlation studies. And uh, the field of study um, that is devoted to, to understanding this, to what extent did uh, particular event A lead to a, a, a change in outcome B, right? Um, uh, by itself is called the field of impact evaluation, impact assessment. The third point is that a sample size um, is not a judgment. It is an output of a formula based on how much margin of error you can tolerate. And it doesn't really depend much on the size of the population. You would use the same sample size, whether you're trying to find out how many people in India are going to vote for BJP next time, or you know, uh, you just worried about say the next Karnataka state elections, right? The sample size would be pretty much the same. And uh, doing good research is, is tough. Uh, although it seems easy once you, you know, take a couple of uh, courses, it does need a lot of experience and mastering the techniques. And uh, there is low level of evidence-based thinking in India and a huge uh, HR shortage. So uh, you can certainly consider uh, a career in it. It's, uh, it's super fun. Um, so this is the, the test for the class. Um, I'll leave the slide on for a second. Um, this class is, uh, this uh, hour has met as a if you get this joke. So uh, that's all I have for today. Any questions? Um, how should we move next? Yeah, guys, questions? Anyone, any questions? If you have any questions, you take the mic and then question. Anyone of our viewers online, do you have any questions? Correct, yeah. Uh, Finam, sir, do you have any question? I, oh, I thought you just unmuted yourself anyway. So maybe they're all thinking and, you know, yeah. sir, is amazing. Sir, are you saying hi, something? Uh, yeah, yeah, hi, sorry. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah, we can hear you. Um, yes, it's been, uh, it's been a very good, uh, um, a very good, uh, you know, coverage on the, uh, on the topic of uh, quantitative research. And uh, and I think you know uh, the students at the stage uh, of uh, uh, you know the uh, you know the uh, presentates master students they are actually exploring some of those research questions. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Karuna, actually, uh, if I'm audible, uh, you yeah, you are um, yeah yes sir. So yeah, I I actually teach one subject wherein uh, we are also. Uh, exploring, uh, I teach uh, building construction and materials, and we are uh, actually exploring uh, uh, with the students, along with the students, um, you know, how we can formulate a question. You picked up the three questions at the beginning of your uh, uh, presentation from what the students were examining. So we are trying to do something similar uh, in our class. And in that context, I thought uh, some of my students in my elective class also would benefit uh, with your lecture. So, um, you know, so we are looking at uh, actually, if you took a technical subject like uh, building construction and uh, materials, 
and uh, a, a sort of a broad area of study uh, within that. Uh, then within that, uh, how can a student develop a mind, a research-oriented mind, uh, sort of develop a sort of a method, uh, what method can uh, he or she propose to conduct this research? So this is some of the things that we were dabbling with. So yeah, I just wanted to share that with you, Mr. Mr. Karuna. So uh, it's been a good presentation, uh, Mr. Karuna. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Thank you, sir. Any more questions, guys? If I may ask, so I have a question, which I think that the students also will have in the due course of time when they start data collection. Um, the idea is that when you, whenever you're doing a research, an on-ground field survey for a particular subject, how do you decide upon what would be a good sample size for your research? Like, uh, for I'm sure that they would also, uh, the sample size will differentiate based on the typology of the research you are doing. But uh, like, how, how does a researcher define that, okay, I think 100 samples would be good for me to complete this study or say 100 is less, I need 500. How do you decide that? Yeah. So uh, uh, the, the formula to use is, is easily Googleable. There are online calculators as well. Um, it needs uh, uh, three inputs uh, to be fed into the formula. Uh, one of them is, like I said, what is the margin of error? Do you want to take a concrete example of, uh, of say, what the what popular uh, what sample average the the survey is looking to collect? Can you give give me an example? Uh, okay, so I will. Probably the first example that comes to my mind is a recent research that I finished in which I was trying to understand the psychology of working women faculty. So I was trying, I, my target group was only women faculty across boards all uh, over the country. But uh, like I was not able to decide upon what will be a good sample to give my conclusions to understand. And it was basically psychology post pandemic. How have things changed for them? So uh, I was not able to figure out a concrete number as in what number of samples is good to give a, to inform my yeah. studies. Yeah, so uh, this is actually a, a problem that uh, every researcher faces. So um, uh, if you already concluded your study, then um, um, what you could do is given your sample size, it is easy to calculate for you now, what is the margin of error? Okay, there is a formula for that. I could just share it offline. So when you're presenting it, um, you can present if you're saying that, uh, for instance, like X percent, your, one of your conclusions is X percentage of people you interviewed uh, showed some psychological characteristic, right? Let's say it's 50%. Uh, based on the, uh, if you've chosen a sample of 100, then um, I could share the formula or it's, it's easily Googleable as well. Either way, you can now calculate what is the margin of error that you have. And then when you communicate, you can say that, yes, I interviewed 100 people and uh, uh, my average is, uh, say, 50%, but uh, this comes with a margin of error of plus or minus maybe 15%. Maybe that's what yours was, right? So you can compute that and then present it to the audience so the audience can, you know, uh, take it in perspective. But if you want for a new study uh, to, uh, um, to decide on what is the right sample size for a new study, um, Unfortunately, you need a previous study to do the sample size calculation for a new study um, because you need three things. You need, the, uh, you need a guess of the population's average of some variable that you're describing. Uh, the second is its standard deviation, okay? And the third is the margin of error, margin of error that you're willing, to, uh, that you want, okay. okay? If you input these three things into the formula, then the formula will tell you, and you can, you can just Google online uh, sample size calculator, survey sample size calculator, for instance. Uh, there's plenty of these. Mm -hmm. You need to input these three things and then you get uh, the sample size out of it. So the only thing that you know for sure is your margin of error that you're willing to tolerate, right? Yes. Uh, but you don't, you're doing a survey to find the mean and standard deviation. You don't already know it. Mm -hmm. So either you have to guess it or you'll have to look at some other study, okay, and use their standard deviation. Some published study 
where or some a previous data set, maybe a similar survey that was done before, and take a look at it, look at their mean and standard deviation. Okay. That's unfortunately the only way of doing it. Okay, okay. Fine, fine. Thank you, sir. Any more questions, anyone? Okay, while everyone is thinking, Karuna, uh, one more question. So we sometimes talk about how researchers have to be very creative as well in designing their research. Mm -hmm. Can you give us some example as where you had to go off the norm of, you know, what kind of methods they have been using and be a little more creative about researching for something? Well, um, I would say like this, um, I, think, I think research is largely a nerdy field, um, which requires, you know, learning techniques and then applying them, right? So, um, so, so that is the core part of it. Um, in terms of, I think, where creativity comes in, I would say in the following areas. I think for the, the first uh, uh, thing about creativity is really good judgment in the sense that you should choose a good research topic uh, uh, whose uh, findings are valuable for a large number of people, okay? So this is not exactly creativity, but this calls for sound judgment. Right? But, uh, uh, your uh, research topic should be, you should, you should motivate yourself that uh, your research topic is a valuable one that is of uh, of uh, you know of value and help for uh, uh, for a sizable number of people. So that is one thing. Um, so the quantitative studies, such as say randomized controlled trials and everything, are um, um, the creativity there comes identifying the opportunity, right? So in the earlier uh, slide, I had one about. Um, uh, exact clever ways to find a control group, right? So there are any number of, uh, uh, finding a control group is not easy because uh, you can't do before and after comparisons for many things because the world would change around you. So you want to do a survey and compare one group to another group. Um, I would say that a lot of creativity goes into clever ways of finding this, uh, this control group, okay? Um, and this is, I think, kind of a super fun uh, thing to do. I'm just trying to see if I have an example um, of, um, um, of, uh, of a research study that I did um, uh, where I had to do, uh, uh, I had to find a, well, yes, I do have a study in mind where I, uh, but it's a little bit complicated to explain, but I'll just stop with saying that, you know, uh, clever ways to find a control group um, is uh, is in fact uh, in fact I'll I'll give you one example right so uh, a brilliant study done by one person was uh, again Abhijit Banerjee who won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago was to find out whether you know uh, princely uh, versus rural states right to what extent uh, the quality of public services uh, was uh, worse or better off in uh, in uh, British run states as opposed to princely states because British were extractive in nature, right? They didn't really care about better roads and better water. They just want to take the wealth and then export it to, uh, to, uh, to their country. And uh, so they did a very clever thing in which they couldn't blindly just compare uh, princely states with um, uh, 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 British run states because they could be inherently very different kinds of places, right? Maybe the British went to the richer places and left the poorer places to, to the Indian princes to run. So they used something called the, uh, the, the doctrine of lapse in which uh, if a, a British, uh, sorry, a princely king died without an heir, right? Then the, it, automatically that state would come into the British. And since death of, uh, of, um, uh, 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 of a king uh, with an heir, uh, with a prince is as good as random, they compared uh, those states that got acquired by the British because the king died without an heir uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, other princely states. And this is like, to me, a very clever and creative way of finding out to what extent, uh, uh, you know, uh, British uh, uh, rule, direct rule had a bad influence on, uh, on public facilities like water and roads. And this uh, survey and found out that even till this day, 
the quality of uh, uh, British run uh, uh, public services in British run like water, right, uh, was worse off in, in British run uh, states compared to uh, uh, compared to uh, uh, Prince, uh, in Prince, uh, princely state. So uh, this is something that I consider creative, uh, but uh, uh, otherwise it is the application of techniques where I think creativity and I would say more of sound judgment comes into play is in, in these non-technical studies where you have to use mixed methods, uh, more of a qualitative approach for whatever reason, right? On answering complicated questions, I think uh, as much as creativity, it's your own diligence, your interest in it, and then using your judgment to find out, you know, uh, when you talk to a handful of people, asking them complicated questions, how to distill those and come up with some key things that you think are like generalizable, right? So I would say that's an area, another area where I, uh, to me, it's kind of creative. But uh, yeah, this is what I have to uh, say about the creative uh, aspects of, uh, uh, creative aspects of, uh, of research. Thanks, Karuna. Yeah, there's one question. Hi, sir. I'm a part of a formative study. That's uh, what I'm looking for. And uh, I had a lot of trouble finding sources for the study that I'm doing. Like uh, research papers and all were not entirely published wherever I found them on ResearchGate and things like that. So other than old research papers, what all can you legibly uh, consult for your research? Like I found a lot of articles, but I'm not sure if they, can, if they are uh, legible enough to be put in a research for myself um yeah no i would say that uh, uh, people often sign see uh, uh, let me just talk about research papers in terms of your literature review uh, google scholar is a, is a great source okay uh, it's free and i think it pretty much has a lot of uh, content uh, second one is jstor uh, jstor has a lot of uh, free valuable content as well uh, the third thing is, uh, you know, figure out, uh, just find out who the experts are you can, and uh, in terms of academics or researchers, and uh, you can go to their uh, website and, you know, and gather this information, uh, see if they publish something. But uh, if uh, none of those really has worked um, and there's no, there's really no publications, uh, peer reviewed publications on these things. Um, and I don't, uh, next, uh, worse, quality of evidence is non-peer reviewed, non-journal published, but still maybe it's a, it's a reputable firm, right? Such as, I don't know, McKinsey or something like that. They may write something that's not peer reviewed, but you know, because they are famous, you can say that, okay, maybe it's not too terrible. But uh, if all of these uh, fail, uh, then you can uh, quote famous people. You can trust, uh, I think, the, the views of famous people. Um, um, there are some papers uh, published in economics which quote, uh, you know, Twitter uh, posts of by famous people, right? Who are experts in their field, for instance. And uh, you can also uh, cite uh, newspaper uh, newspaper articles. Uh, those are also done in uh, in credible papers uh, where there is simply no evidence, right? Uh, you just go with the reputation of the institution that's uh, saying something without strong evidence, and just. Uh, uh, presume that you know they are exercise good judgment and things like newspapers you know uh, their their whole you know livelihood is based on uh, uh, not making uh, errors right so I think you can cite those uh, uh, newspapers as well. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Any more questions? Alicia, can you check if online or audience has any questions? Students and participants online, do you have anything that you would like to ask, sir? You can type it out also in the chat box. So you guys have a hybrid model, is it? Uh, people can both come uh, to classroom as well as uh, do uh, online is it is it a covid thing 
Uh, no, I mean, right now we don't have a hybrid uh, system. We are all uh, doing offline studies only. So everyone has to come to com campus. But because this was an elective subject, we opened up a, and you were doing it from Goa. So we had the opportunity of opening it, it up for larger audience, you know, oh uh, through the Zoom link. So there are others who have joined in through the Zoom link. I don't see any questions coming from the online side. Uh, okay, Karuna, so I had a question. So when you take up these researches, how do you uh, get the funds to actually fund? Like you said, you give my pe people, so you've done, uh, you know, surveys and you've given 2000 rupees per person per survey, something like that. So where do you generate this fund for your research? Um, so, yeah, um, well, I'll just tell you some of the uh, sources where I've applied for a grant and I got it from. Uh, the World Bank, if you have some contacts there, uh, they'll give you some funds. Uh, if it is, uh, you know, something uh, that helps inform their projects, you know, in their focus areas, right? So basically funders, uh, there are two kinds of funders, I guess, uh, those that fund academicians, and uh, those uh, that fund some action research, uh, uh, what do you say? Uh, uh, there are funders that, uh, that specialize in funding um, uh, academic, uh, academic research institutions. So an example of that that I applied for is NCAER had a, I think, data innovation uh, center. Some, uh, yeah, data innovation center. Uh, they called for a call of proposals and uh, uh, and I applied, you know, and received a grant from them. Uh, it was for innovative ways of, of collecting uh, survey data. So NCR is one of them. The International Labour Organization uh, uh, was another one. The World Bank is another one. Um, a lot of people hit up the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, because they have a lot of money. But uh, and they and all of these organization, organizations typically have a call for grants that you apply to. Um, uh, or um, um, uh, they'll have a request for proposals uh, based on uh, someone that they want to hire to write them a report on either formative research or uh, or an ex or an evaluation of one of the completed projects. Um, for instance, uh, uh, I mean, my role is a little bit different because mine is more of a guide. For instance, I'm just starting a project with the uh, United Nations Development Program in Mongolia. Um, for which they had put out a request for proposals for someone like me to guide the agency that the government of Mongolia will hire in order to um, uh, evaluate one of their climate resilience projects. So that was based on a request for proposals. Um, so I would say it's a combination. There is a, a large number of funders, uh, although uh, the funding is in general drying up in India. Uh, the interest is more in, say, in funding Africa these days. Um, so uh, so I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but basically like every white country has a development, co international development agency, right? Um, so in the UK, it's called uh, DFID, it's in, in the US, it's called USAID. Uh, then you have these multilands like uh, United Nations, International Labour Organization, uh, World Bank, um, uh, uh, Australia has AusAid, for instance. So um, those are the kind of people that applied research. Um, uh, while if you're looking more for an academic uh, kind of a setting, I'm not. Uh, I'm not as sure. Uh, I'm not as sure uh, uh, who would be more interested in academic kind of research. Thanks. And what about fellowships? And we have a lot of research fellowships also available. So, can you shed some light on that as well? Uh, fellowships means like. Uh, some place where uh, they pay you to do research kind of a thing. You go to the center and they pay you to do, to, to do yeah, research. Yeah, the center or you know, the government funded kind of fellowships that, are hap that happen. Uh, government funded, I don't know because the government, uh, their funding amounts will be very small, right? So that's also, again, a reason why we don't have good evidence in India because we don't have much money to, uh, government doesn't have much money to spend on this, right? So, um, 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 Again, uh, so what I have done is really the request for proposal route. Uh, recently, for instance, somebody put me in a proposal to a, a Niti Aayog uh, 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 proposal. Um, 
for um, improving governance kind of a thing, right? Uh, where they had a sizable budget. But for, I have applied to fellowships in the past, but they are somewhat idiosyncratic. I think you're better off with, uh, uh, with international NGOs. Uh, international NGOs uh, such as Axion, for instance, is one that I, uh, where I had applied for a fellowship, ACCION. Um, so uh, I don't know exactly what to say because of course uh, I'm not from your field, um, uh, but uh, I would just look at uh, funding agencies that are working in your field and uh, calls or proposals just come out once in a while. Um, I'm not sure if that was very helpful, but that's, I've just summarized uh, uh, my experience in, uh, in, in raising funds. Um, I think the key thing is that uh, it's more of a matchmaking thing, uh, just to identify who is uh, you know, looking for researchers uh, uh, in areas that you are interested in, right? And I think that just comes from uh, uh, spending more time in the field and identifying the agencies because agencies don't just fund anything, right? Uh, unless it's uh, like an academic uh, kind of a funder uh, that's mainly there abroad uh, that is willing to fund basic research. Um, otherwise, it's usually a funder that has a certain program area in which they want to give money to governments or NGOs to do certain kinds of projects and uh, with certain themes, right? Could be health or climate resilience or whatnot, right? Or COVID for that matter. I think it's a question of identifying which organization is working, um, uh, has uh, program areas in your areas of interest and then shortlisting them. So I'm not sure if that was super helpful, but that's kind of uh, what I could say about that. Yeah, thanks. That was quite informative. Any other questions, guys? Uh, I was also wondering, I mean, sometimes when we study a lot about in, uh, you know, research and architecture and all, uh, people would tend to say or state, a lot of books also state that you should not, uh, you should not base your decisions on quantitative research. Uh, I would vote because on quantitative research and because yeah. you are an expert on quantitative research, I would want to know what is your take on that such a statement or, you know, such a statement or what, what do you think is what, what, what are they trying to refer to when they say that? I don't know. They're saying I, that I quantitative and qualitative is both important, but when you're making the final decision, don't base it on the quantitative results alone is what uh, uh, the state. Yeah, see, I have kind of seen this uh, even by academic types in like, you know, IITs and all that. I do think that, I do think, just to give a couple of expansive thoughts, okay. Uh, one is that I do think that uh, sometimes it is very difficult for somebody in, in one field, one department to communicate well to uh, somebody in another department uh because they don't know each other's domain there are two things right the domain knowledge whether it's architecture or public health or you know uh farming or whatnot right uh, or climate change each person is working in a certain domain they've been, they've been trained they've learned in that department they use their own terminology uh, so i find it very difficult to communicate effectively with uh, researchers uh, from another department uh, because of the terminology issue and plus the there's a little bit of a lack of, uh, what do you say, uh, for want of another word, I'll say like trust because they think, hey, you don't know my field. Right? So why are you being young when, uh, uh, when you don't know my, my field? Uh, they, they might feel that way, right? So um, that is the first expansive thing that I want to say. The second thing is, yes, I do hear this sometimes that people think that, uh, 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 that there is an overemphasis on quantitative and, uh, le uh, and less of a trust on qualitative. Um, I think they both serve different purposes. One of them is not a replacement for the other. Um, uh, the, the main complaint that I might have, uh, okay, let me critique quantitative methods. Maybe that might be helpful. Um, the, the main critique about quantitative methods is that uh, it doesn't tell you enough information. Finally, it might, uh, again, taking the true crime shows example, it may, uh, you might uh, be able to give, produce one number, okay? Psychological variable between those who watch crime shows and those who don't, and this is X percentage, okay? So, but the quantitative method will not be able to tell you why is why this happened, okay? Uh, it, uh, the quantitative method doesn't really have, can't really tell you much more than this. They can just give you one number, okay? 
while a qualitative exploration, let's say you finish the study, then you can do a qualitative study where you sit with like 50 of these uh, crime show watches and then, you know, sit with them, talk, chat with them for an hour or two and try to uh, unearth some uh, more profound or inf insightful reasons about why watching these shows um, caused uh, these psychological changes and how they can be addressed for the betterment in the future. So I think uh, this deeper insight uh, normally is not there in quantitative. That is, I think, one thing. Uh, so, but the main message is that there are, there are two different things. A quantitative, like a survey, is to find out the uh, estimate the population average of some some variable, uh, uh, percentage watch, uh, true crime shows, whatever, right? Um, uh, and certainly, it is not a a qualitative study is not a substitute for that. It, it cannot be, um, uh, nor can, a, uh, can you ask complicated questions in a, in a structured survey for which you need qualitative. Um, so this is the second thing. Uh, I think people just don't understand. I heard ridiculous things from people, researchers saying, oh, research needs to be more participatory. They don't even know what that means. You know, uh, They think that the end user is being excluded from the research and, you know, and the project. Uh, so they say that it should be more participatory. Well, that simply means do more qualitative studies. That's all it really means. Um, that's the second. The last thing I think maybe for this disconnect is that I think quantitative researchers who might largely be, I think, economists are very arrogant. Okay, um, And so they think they know everything and uh, they value their mastery of these technical skills, right? To answer some things very precisely uh, more than, um, uh, and that is that is the what an economist will do, or somebody in applied statistics will do, as opposed to say maybe somebody from in architecture who is not interested in you know uh, finding clever control groups and doing a fancy quantitative method, but uh, instead uh, their uh, their uh, what do you say their uh, uh, purpose of inquiry would be to get a deep understanding of one question, okay, um, uh, to get a deep profound, insightful uh, 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 learning uh, about, about some questions that they have, right? Whatever the question is, how do you build more eco-friendly homes, whatever. I'm just trying to make some examples that are more relevant to you. While people who are good at quantitative, uh, they are not really masters of any one profound question like that. They do little studies here and there where they can do without really mastering any one area. Uh, um, if they don't spend enough time and you know qualitative studies on, on this. So I think this is, uh, I think this arrogance thing is also, I feel uh, like a factor and I, I've seen it as well, yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, last thing for me, I mean, from, for, you took the example, like you showed, showed us how qualitative uh, studies could help us in formative uh, research, right? Where we are, where we are evaluating whether or not a certain project, say, is feasible before the project or something like that. Uh, or we are trying to, uh, say, select a certain material for a certain application in a building. So their formative uh, research would help us a lot. So in that sense, do you think qualitative research would be enough or should we go into quantitative, quantifying, uh, you know? Um, should we go into quantitative research methods as well to finally, you know, finally come to a decision as to whether or not go forward with the project or whether or not go forward with a selection of material or something. Um, uh, again, I would say it depends on the question, say material, uh, for instance, uh, I can't exactly answer based on what you've said, but I'll just make up a hypothetical example and you can let me know whether it's, you know, you're able to relate to your question or not. Actually, let me try to understand. Uh, tell me your example again, uh, material for what? For housing construction. Yeah, say if a material for, for like walling material, you know, what kind of wall should we go for? Should we go for AAC blocks or should we go for brick or should we go for panels, uh, composite panels which are available or should we go for a mud uh, construction? So that kind of a decision making for uh, an architectural project. So uh, again, I would say it is just based on the question. Uh, if your question of interest is uh, what percentage of potential home uh, uh, buyers or renters, right? Um, uh, what percentage of them want diff these different kinds of materials, right? Then um, if you want, if your question is that, right? 
then I can't, uh, then you'll have to do a structured survey. You need like a good sample and you need to ask them, this, maybe show them this thing and say, okay, will you buy this? Will, do you like this, right? Just to answer the question, do you like it? Right? It's a simple, easy, easy question to ask and you genuinely want to know what percentage of homeowners uh, like it and would buy it, then you have to go the quantitative way. While, um, yeah, I, I would say you will have to go to the, to find out the size of your market. So markets, I think the, I would place this under the area of market sizing, for which I think you have to do a, a, a quantitative survey. While, um, um, I'm just trying to give an example of where a qualitative approach would be more suitable. Uh, Maybe what do people, you know, like to stay in your, what kind of construction do people like subjectively that, do you think that would uh, be more of a qualitative research? Um, I would say that any question that you have, where it is very easy to ask, okay, it's very easy to just read blindly read from a questionnaire, and somebody, the respondent, can very easily understand it, visualize it, and answer and answer quickly. Um, and your question is, what percentage of the population? Um, uh, what is the average for the population right, for this question? Then a structured survey is the is the only way to go. Um, um, while um, um, let's say, okay, fine, the, the, you might have a fabrication material, but then maybe you might have a certain design, right? Um, or you might uh, be thinking, uh, I'm just making a hypothetical example since I'm not an architect, but let's say you want to figure out um, how do you design a, a kitchen, right? What kind of materials you put, what should be the layout and everything, right? So, um, um, so that people like it, like it and buy it, right? For this, to inform you about how to design this, right, in a way that people will like, it has to be a qualitative, formative research where you, uh, because you'll have to spend a lot of time with a few people and you can't spend this time with thousands of people, you'll have to spend maybe a, a couple of few hours with a certain number of people, showing them different options, talking to them, finding out what, uh, make them actually use it maybe in a sample house. Uh, to figure out what they like, what they don't like, what they're able to use easily, and things like that, to, to get an understanding of that, uh, of that, right? That would have to be like an expert, uh, kind of a, if it's an ex more exploratory, where you don't know exactly what to ask, how to phrase your question, then I would say qualitative uh, is certainly the way to go, if it's uh, something complicated. So I don't know if that answers, answers the question or not, but this is a good question to ask, but I don't know if that, uh, the way I said it answered your question or not. It does uh, actually, but uh, to, to continue a little bit more into it, uh, how do we conclude like, to conclude uh, something from quantitative research is easy. You have these quantifiable, you know, quantified data and you say, okay, so, and thus we see that, you know, conclusion so and so. But if you have a very free flowing interview with people for qualitative research, how do you conclude something from qualitative research and you know yeah, with, yeah but it, it, again it, it really depends on what you want to conclude uh, like i said um, uh, there are two unique purposes right a quantitative research is simply to find out the population average for some variable right some variable that's very easy to answer and very easy to find out if you are interested in the population's uh, uh, variable um, uh, for instance um, I think qualitative is primarily to understand something that you don't know anything about and uh, where you're not trying to say something that is, uh, where it is too complex to interview too many people, such as, I mean, again, I'll go to the example of maybe a, a mobile app, right? The user interface for an app, right? To figure out what, how you should design your user interface, there's no way you can do a quantitative thing, right? Um, because it's too complicated because you want to take their inputs in order to redesign it better, right? So you can't just ask people, hey, do you like this or not? Or on a scale of one to 10, how much do you like this user interface, right? And at the end of it, you interview a thousand people and then you get an average of say six. What do you do with this information, right? You don't have any use for this information. While this is an example of where you would have to sit with a handful of people and this way you have to use your judgment. So I would say that qualitative exploratory nature where you sit with a handful of people and it's your judgment. Have I chosen these people from the different groups of my interest correctly? And uh, you have to pay a lot of intention and uh, interest, uh, sorry, attention. And um, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's really your judgment. 
um, and I think it's more applicable in designing something uh, more informative research um, uh, uh, and, and in user experiences, um, uh, which is something that you just can't do with quantitative. Thanks, Karuna. Anything? No, uh, yeah, uh, did that kind of uh, touch upon what you were kind of? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. It definitely does. It definitely clears out a little bit, you know, about where to use what and what would be more helpful when we are trying to formulate a research. You also think about how to convince people, right? Finally, about yeah. research is something about this... convincing people. I mean, if you want to get money from someone or, you know, convince people to spend some money, whatever, right? Like, um, or make people think that you're right, right? So you can't just say, I talked to 50 people, like, you know, then they'll be like, they'll be questioning you, right? They'll be, you're basically they, them believing it is them believing you, believing your report is them believing you, right? Uh, yeah. While if you instead say, no, I interviewed a thousand people, I had, a, you know, a representative sample and, you know, I asked him, and this is the average, then, there, there's yeah. less convincing that's required, right? So yeah. I would say that is the, I would say that you is the trade -off. With numbers, you're, that's what you're saying. And with, if you show evidence in numbers, it's easier to convince someone to fund yeah. or Absolutely. Uh, accept yeah. your, uh, you know, judgments that way. Yeah, I think it just takes away, um, the difference would be like, yeah, uh, like I said, uh, quality and, and quantitative are for completely different things. They, I don't really see an overlap between them. They are, they are complementary to each other. Um, uh, for the most part, um, and uh, yeah, I, th I think it's uh, it's easier for for convincing someone that you know that I, yeah, thousand people is better than fifty people, right? Do you think uh, our own biases have a good role to play in the conclusions that we draw in qualitative or quantitative? Which one has more possibility of your bias actually rendering the final conclusion? So, I mean, uh, again, like I said, like uh, the two things are very different, right? So I'll give an, uh, the short answer is yes, absolutely. Okay. So recently, um, my colleagues uh, at the World Bank commissioned a study uh, about gender empowerment for a project that we are doing in Jharkhand, where uh, the project is about uh, identifying female farmers and uh, giving them uh, 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 tools as well as better uh, crop production techniques, because as you know, India has some of the lowest yields in the world, right? So uh, this is a project where you kind of ignore the male farmer and, and work with the female farmer in the house because we, we feel that, you know, there is a lot of intra-household inequality. And uh, the project is about uh, uh, helping them become better farmers and earning more income for their family, right? So we hired one of India's best uh, and certainly one of the most expensive uh, consulting agencies called Oxford, well, I'll say the name anyway, yeah, Oxford Policy Management, um, to do this gender study, okay? And, uh, okay, uh, so this is just between us now. And uh, so it was my job to uh, to guide them and then to read the report and give them feedback. And uh, and don't get mad at me for saying this, right? But the, the lead scientist there was a PhD in uh, sociology or something like that. And, it just read like a very, very angry rant, you know, like a very, very angry um, at the world kind of a rant. Um, informally, maybe I'll just share with you the report, right? This is an expensive study and it was such a rant, a non-evidenced uh, rant against uh, inequality and the kind of sexism uh, uh, that women face in rural Jharkhand, right? Um, it is no doubt, uh, what do you say? No doubt they're on to something. We all know that there is sexism and there is uh, gender-based inequality uh, and uh, uh, even, even like oppression, if you if you will, in rural Jharkhand. But as a, as a researcher, as someone who's trying to write something about this so that the government, the World Bank can understand what the core issues are, and to act on it, right? To do something to, to improve this inequality, right? But instead it was such a rant uh, reflecting the bias of uh, this uh, lead female researcher who had a PhD from a very good university that it was so bad that I had to recommend that this study, that we just pay them, but just not use the study. So, um, and this was based on interviews with, I think uh, like 
50 households or something like that. So I told him right from the beginning, boss, uh, this is a very complicated thing. If you want to, because we don't even know what to tell you to go and study. We are asking you to go and find out, hey, this is a gender empowerment project. Go and learn something about whether the project's working towards the gender angle or not. And uh, tell us what we can do to improve things, right? Um, uh, and so they insisted because of shortage of time and COVID that to interview only 50 people. I told them then, boss, like if you're only going to interview 50 people, then you better be uh, back up every sentence that you say with some evidence, right? That is convincing. And just don't overemphasize one point there um, just because one person out of 50 said it, right? So I told, I warned them right from the beginning, like you better back everything that you say because you're going to be questioned, right? Uh, because you don't have a sample size where you're asking uh, questions in a more dispassionate manner, right? Such as what a survey will do, right? You simply ask, like, okay, uh, are you happy with this project, right? Which is a dumb question to ask, but it's, it's easy to ask and easy to answer, right? Like it's kind of dumb to ask, are you happy with this project, right? So um, there at least we can believe uh, that, uh, you know, uh, the question was asked in an unbiased manner. Although there could be measurement error uh, if it is a complicated question, right? So I don't know if I'm just being confusing there. What I'm saying is that, yes, certainly there is bias. Absolutely there is bias in qualitative uh, research. And that's why only very few people uh, who are, I think, very good at this uh, can come up with uh, something uh, that is representative, unbiased, and convincing uh, and can convince the reader. There's very, very few people that I met uh, who can do this. While on the other hand, quantitative is, like I said, only for very simple questions. Otherwise, uh, it's easy to disbelieve a quantitative study as well, because if the question is too complicated, then um, uh, I will certainly doubt that the interviewer, who might be a 10th pass, right, who has to do like 20 interviews or 10 interviews in a day under a hot sun walking around a village, right? Either he would have faked the data or he didn't understand it properly, you know, or didn't ask it properly, or it was too complicated for the respondent to understand. Because, you know, if it's an illiterate or a low, uh, lowly educated uh, respondent, they won't understand. They can't think uh, things in the abstract the way we can. Um, so uh, there will be a different kind of a measurement error in quantitative studies. But yeah, uh, that was a fairly lengthy uh, answer to, uh, to, I guess, your short question. Yes, absolutely, there is bias. And that is why qualitative studies uh, should say as little as possible as little as possible, but only say things that are that you're convinced about and you're able to convince the reader. If you start putting in things that, you know, just because it kind of sounds interesting, but you know, it's not really convincing, then that will take away the credibility of the entire report. So I would say put uh, put few insightful uh, findings in there that you can uh, defend and justify uh, if you want to convince the reader. Thanks, Karuna. That was, uh, yeah, that answers my doubt. Uh, but people also say that you beat up data enough and it'll give you the answer that you want from it, right? So, uh, what about that? I don't know about that. See, I mean, uh, there are two or three ways in which you can uh, get the wrong thing from a data. Uh, one is, of course, simply like, you know, uh, measurement error, which is that uh, either the person asking the questions fake the data. Okay? He sat under a tree and just filled in the form, right? But there are some checks and balances to prevent them from doing it. You can use uh, tablets to collect. And th there are many ways of sorting. So that's less of a problem. You can do back checks, uh, go interview the same people again, just to, on a subset, just to make sure they said the same thing. Um, uh, so measurement error, let's say it's I think primarily that is something primarily. Uh, uh, Karina, uh, we lost you for a second huh? there. Yeah, no, I'm saying for that, a second uh, there. Yeah, I'll just repeat. Um, I don't know. Uh, see, I have my own understanding of what people uh, mean uh, when they say that uh, you can draw different kind of conclusions from the data from the same data, right? Um, uh, the short answer is um, just focusing on analysis alone. Uh, the short answer is yes for correlation studies. You can find correlation between anything, and somehow you can uh, you can you can um, massage the data into saying anything. But um, um, where you can't fudge is uh, uh, when you have a valid control group um, and you're transparent with uh, with your method of analysis. 
then there is a lot less scope for uh, fudging data. Uh, it is still possible, but the scope is a lot less. Uh, other, uh, uh, so, uh, so you know, regression methods, regression, right? Um, uh, that is the common way of finding correlation between two variables. Uh, yes, absolutely, you can fake correlation. I mean, I'm sure you can find correlation between any two things, right? Um, uh, between, yeah, between any two things, you can find a correlation, even if it doesn't mean A cause B, it can be correlated to B, okay? Yeah. So for doing correlation, yes, you can uh, massage the data into saying anything, but uh, that is super easy. Uh, but I think the field of research has advanced to a point of uh, taking more interest, less interest in correlations because you can't learn anything from it. And like you said, you can yeah, cheat. Yeah. Absolutely, um, because we've seen a lot of, of research. Huh? Go on, go on. I mean, I was just adding that we have seen a lot of, uh, you know, research papers based on only correlation and con and then concluding that see, we see a lot of correlation between this and that and this and that. And so we conclude. So, that uh, so should, I think, uh, yeah, see, this is a thing, quite right? dangerous way. No, it is, it is dangerous and it's also reflective of the low. Uh, I don't, I've never cited an Indian paper, okay? Like zero, okay? Uh, because uh, uh, the quality of research in India is very low. The thing is that, um, uh, it's the, I think how people are trained in their PhD for people who do a PhD within India. Um, uh, you might be, if you're a doctor, you know, and you become a researcher, for instance, right? You will become a good doctor, but on top of that, asking you to learn statistics and all that, being a master of that, right? Uh, it's just, uh, they can't, you can't learn everything, right? So you won't be a good statist statistician and you might not, you know, fully understand the difference between correlation and uh, causality. Uh, correlation basically tells you close to nothing, right? Like you can't really, you don't really learn anything with any certainty with a correlation study and you can do all your fudging there. So I think, uh, uh, I think the answer is effective interdepartmental cooperation uh, between somebody who's a subject matter expert, like say you as an architect or an urban planner, uh, whatever, and cooperating with like a, a statistician or an economist Who's, who might not know much about architecture, but knows about causal studies. I think that cooperation is not there. Instead, uh, uh, because there is difficult difference in terminologies and that, ma that matchmaking is not there sufficiently. Uh, instead, uh, 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 people who are good in some department, just learn a little bit of statistics. And I think journals are letting them publish them in India as well. Um, simply because I think they think that uh, saying something wrong about an important topic is more important than avoiding that topic altogether because you don't have strong evidence. I think this is where it's coming. I can't justify it in any other way, apart from maybe even the journals don't know the difference between correlation and causality, which is also possible. Um, uh, so I think it's like, you know, uh, we're not knowledgeable enough uh, here and the only solution is to cooperate uh, between departments. Thank you so much, Karuna. It was a really nice and enriching uh, experience. Uh, students, any more, any more uh, questions from your side? Uh, Alicia, can you check if there are any more questions uh, online? Uh, there are no questions in the chat box. So once again, asking the students who are joining online if you have anything to say. Alicia, students want to clap. Yeah, okay. okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I think they got, uh, yeah, yes, I think they got a very clear picture of what, because we were just starting with the idea of qualitative and quantitative with them. And each of one of them has been very, uh, very sincere with their efforts to trying to understand research because it's a very, very new concept for them, the whole structural framework. So I think uh, the presentation has kind of done a wonderful job for them. So thank you so much, sir, for joining us, taking out your precious time. And uh, I hope that uh, it would be nice for us to share in later when once these students come up with their research papers and their research ideas, what they ultimately did so that uh, you can also give them some constructive criticism in the future. So yeah, absolutely. Uh, my pleasure. And uh, thanks for having me over. It's my pleasure. No problem, sir. The pleasures are all ours. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Take care. Bye, sir. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Karuna. Bye. Uh,
Yeah, Alicia, you can stop the meeting.